Greetings one and all, uh, and in Darug, the Sydney language, uh, Warami, good to see you. I begin by acknowledging the First Nations of the country we now call Australia and their custodianship of the land over tens of thousands of years. I pay respect to their elders past and present. May we all be guided by God's wisdom, which the original inhabitants of this continent have been cherishing through the eons. And may we listen to that wisdom, which teaches its disciples to give voice to those who, whose voices were and are suppressed. I am Doro Kostake, an associate professor in theology at the Sydney College of Divinity, in which capacity I chair the Theology Research Network, TRN, as well as the research director of ISCAST. It is my pleasure to host the fourth TRN ISCAST seminar this year, and the honor of introducing today's speaker, Associate Professor Megan Best. Megan is a research associate uh, at the Institute of Ethics and Society at the University of Notre Dame, Australia, a bioethicist and palliative care physician. Her research on the spiritual care of patients has influenced the development of training for healthcare professionals internationally. And you'll be seeing uh, in the flyer uh, her many affiliations. She has published extensively in the areas of spirituality and healthcare, bioethics, and psycho-oncology. The response to Megan's uh, paper will be given by April McNeil, who is a PhD student with the Australian Catholic University and a provisional education consultant with the New South Wales College of Clinical Pastoral Education. With a background in critical care nursing, April has had extensive experience as a pastoral care practitioner educator and department manager in acute health care. She's passionate about the opportunity for collaborative inquiry between theology and medicine and is exploring the application of Bernard Lonergan's methodologies in understanding the patient experience. Before we listen to Megan, I invite ISCAS CEO and Executive Director, the Reverend Dr. Chris Mulherin, to greet the speakers and the attendees and to pray for this seminar. Chris. Thank you, Doro. Yes, as I as I said informally before, it is my pleasure to welcome everybody on behalf of ISCAST. Uh, I'm the executive director of ISCAST, and uh, ISCAST exists to promote constructive conversations between Christianity and the sciences. And uh, those sort of constructive conversations are sometimes few and far between in an increasingly sort of polarised world where a lot of people think that science and Christianity can't get along. So uh, it's it's great to be in partnership with the Sydney College of Divinity, uh, promoting promoting these sorts of conversations. Uh, why don't we pray as we begin? Lord God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, we recognise uh, that you are the Creator. You are the one who made human beings in your own image, and uh, we long to know all the implications of that. Uh, today we explore some of that. Uh, Help us today to listen well, uh, help our speakers to speak clearly and help us all to go out into the world and be a, a constructive, uh, constructive agents for the better of uh, all people. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. Uh, thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we begin with uh, Megan's presentation, Spirituality in Healthcare, which will run for about 50 minutes after which we'll listen to April's uh, comments for about 10 minutes. Megan, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you. I'll just share my screen. Well, uh, thank you very much for this opportunity uh, to speak to the ISCAST community today. I thought when I was asked to speak that um, this group might be interested to know what's happening in the spirituality and healthcare research space. I've been researching in this area for the last 12 years. And as has been mentioned, my background is uh, as a physician working in palliative care with patients who have terminal illness. And I first became interested in the topic of spirituality when I saw how important it was uh, for my patients as they were facing their own death. And in my conversations with patients and colleagues, I realized that the relief of suffering was of primary importance to patients, but uh, was less of a focus for doctors. And as I discussed this with my friends, I realized that my friends were quite astounded to realize how little attention given to caring for patients at the end of life is given um, 
doing a medical degree. In fact, uh, there are some uh, medical degrees uh, in Sydney, uh, which are five years in length, and an hour and a half is given to the care of patients at the end of life. So this, um, I decided to look into this whole area more closely. And today I'd like to introduce you to the empirical study of spirituality in healthcare. And we'll begin it uh, by going through a case history, which is a common method of teaching in medicine. So this case uh, was taken from a seminal paper published by Eric Cassell in the New England Journal for Medicine in 1982. A 35-year-old sculptor with breast cancer, a female, was treated by competent and kind physicians. She was uncertain and frightened about the future but she could get little information from her physicians and what she was told was not always the whole truth. Her disease was treated with surgery and radiotherapy. She was not aware that her breast would be so disfigured by the radiotherapy. After the removal of her ovaries and medication, she became hirsute or hairy, obese and devoid of libido. She tolerated it because she was told it was her best chance of a cure. The following year, she relapsed. She developed a tumour in her shoulder, which led to loss of strength in the hand she used for sculpting, and she became profoundly depressed. She had a fracture in her femur due to um, another metastasis of the tumour, and treatment was delayed while her physicians openly disagreed about the best treatment for her hip. Then there was the chemo. The nausea and vomiting were distressing, but no more so than the anticipation of hair loss. Each time her disease responded to therapy and her hope was rekindled, there was a relapse, so that with every new treatment starting, she was torn between a desire to live and the fear that if she allowed herself to hope, she opened herself up to the misery of failure again. She feared the future. Each tomorrow was seen as heralding increased sickness pain or disability, never as the beginning of better times. She felt isolated because she was no longer like other people and could not do what other people did. She feared that her friends would stop visiting her. She was sure that she would die. This woman is suffering. Why? Well, when we look at this case, we see that for this woman, her losses are multiple. There are illness-related losses, loss of health, sexuality, hair, attractiveness, social losses, the inability to maintain her profession of sculpture, loss of confidence as her doctors publicly disagree about her treatment, relational losses, social isolation due to her debility, perhaps isolating herself due to her depression, personal losses, loss of of control over the situation, loss of autonomy as information is withheld, existential losses of meaning, purpose and hope, loss of the future with its aspirations and dreams of the future. I, you can think of more, I'm sure. Loss of your pets as you're no longer able to care for. This type of holistic suffering is usually precipitated by some form of real perceived or anticipated loss. We know the diagnosis of a serious illness like cancer threatens the patient's understanding of their world as they're forced to confront their own limitations and mortality. In fact, while this kind of issue is more common with life-threatening disease, we now know that any major health crisis can precipitate the same process. For example, if you have a young professional football player who has a career-ending injury, he may have a similar existential crisis. This kind of a crisis changes your perception of who you are, where you fit into things, and it raises many questions like these. Spiritual resources are often recruited to provide a framework within which the person can accept and attribute meaning to their experiences and incorporate them within their own life story. Cassell described the process of suffering as disintegration of the self, and the self needs to be restructured in the light of illness and its impact. 
So to help you understand the impact of sickness in someone's world, look at the balance in a healthy person's world with everyday concerns front and center. This changes with a reprioritization of health during sickness. And the sicker you get, the more important spirituality becomes, questions about meaning and also relationships, inability to resolve this predicament can precipitate the existential crisis, potentially leading uh, to holistic suffering. But what exactly do I mean by suffering in the healthcare context? The modern study of spirituality and suffering has its origins in several ideas. Viktor Frankl was a psychiatrist who wrote about his experience in World War II concentration camps. He wasn't surprised that people died there. He was surprised that anybody survived. And he found that when meaning, uh, when suffering had meaning, people could endure. He taught that man's ultimate purpose is not search for power or pleasure, but meaning. And uh, if you haven't read his book, actually, uh, Man's Search for Meaning, I highly, I highly recommend it. Dame Cicely Saunders founded the modern hospice movement in London in the 1960s. She used to sit uh, at the bottom of her patient's bed and listen to their stories, their narratives. And in that way, she discovered that when they spoke about their suffering, it was co constituted not just of physical pain, but also social, emotional, psychological, and spiritual factors. So she developed this model of multidimensional suffering, which uh, she then... Um, named total pain. And uh, this conceptualization of suffering continues in the area of palliative care. And then we have uh, an American physician called Eric Cassell. I've already mentioned his paper published in 1982. And in that paper, he highlighted the problem that had developed in the separation of the mind and the body, as suggested by Descartes in the 17th century. According to this model, mind and body are separate. And as a result, at the time, science claimed the physical body as its domain in order to escape the control of the church um, uh, to which it gave all the other domains. And since then, science and medicine have focused almost entirely on the biological or the biosocial model of the human being. But scientific understanding of reality relies, as you know, on empirical research. So it's led to the situation where matters such as spiritual suffering are viewed as non-scientific and therefore not real, or else identified exclusively with bodily pain because everything has to have a physical cause. And that's what people say, isn't it? Pain and suffering. Um, I uh, reviewed over 6,000 papers uh, on the topic of suffering in the medical literature. And uh, it was unusual to find a discussion of suffering which didn't uh, include a suffering of physical pain. But this is too simplistic. Um, the type of suffering I'm talking about is a holistic suffering, which incorporates all dimensions of the person. Suffering is an existential problem which extends beyond physical pain. It's influenced by multiple factors, um, psychological, cultural, and spiritual factors. Uh, I, I remember a young Asian woman who was dying from breast cancer, and her suffering was increased because of the cultural expectation that she was supposed to look after her parents in their old age, and she knew that she wouldn't be able to fulfill that, that expectation. Patients who struggle to afford their health care, um, particularly in places like the Amer um, America, uh, may have an economic factor contributing to their suffering. And we know um, historical factors, particularly from indigenous groups, but it's particularly being uh, documented in the United States with African-American patients that historical um, Historical examples of them receiving substandard health care adds to their concerns in the present that they may not receive all the care um, that they could get because of their African-American status. 
And this also increases their suffering uh, in healthcare as well. So all these factors influence the meaning attributed to the suffering by the patient. Let me give you an example to help you understand what I mean. For example, imagine we have two women. They're both 32 years old and they both have the same amount of physical pain. They have the same number of nerve fibers firing. And one woman is, is in labor. She's about to have a baby. Her pain um, is there. She knows the pain is there because the baby's coming and soon the pain will stop and she'll have the baby in her arms. The woman with cancer, other woman has cancer and uh, she knows the pain is coming from the thing that's killing her and the pain will not go away before she dies. So even though they both have the same amount of physical pain, I think you can see that the woman with cancer is suffering more. You can probably work out where the pain is coming from, from the biological paradigm. You can possibly work out what medication will reduce its impact. But to fully understand the extent of her suffering, you need to look at the patient as a whole person. So when we incorporate spirituality into healthcare, we need to uh, adopt the biopsychosocial spiritual model of the human being. And this is what uh, many people would see as the focus of what we call holistic health care. So one way of understanding spirituality is as human beings in relationship. And generally across Western populations, four types of supportive relationships have been identified. Some people get their spiritual strength from themselves. These are the stoic types who can just dig deep inside themselves to find the strength they need to cope with hardship. Then there are, are those who have uh, support from significant others. And uh, most commonly in Australia, we'll see people who get their strength from their family. And in fact, I think this is probably the most common um, form of spiritual support for Australians. We have some people who get their support from places and things, perhaps from the environment, from a, a wonderful piece of music or a wonderful work of art. And then we have those who have a relationship with the transcendent or another, uh, a higher being such as God. So according to this model, sickness is a disruption of these relationships, both within, in physiological and psychological terms, and without, in terms of relationships with the environment and other beings. This explains why severe illness is often accompanied by questions about one's relationship with the transcendent and why spirituality in this model can be applied universally to all people. Healing or the meeting of needs will involve restoration of right relationships. In physical terms, this means restoration of right bodily functions. In spiritual terms, healing is possible even when the body doesn't achieve perfect wholeness through resolution, through resolution of questions about meaning, which can be experienced by patients as a lack of anxiety or a sense of peace. So uh, one way in which spirituality has been defined in the healthcare space by an international consensus group was uh, a dynamic and intrinsic aspect of humanity through which persons seek ultimate meaning, purpose, and transcendence, and experience relationship to self, family, others, community, society, nature, and the significant or sacred. Spirituality is expressed through beliefs, values, traditions, and practices. Thus, spirituality in healthcare has been described as the way people engage with the purpose and meaning of human existence, and the way this informs their personal values. So spirituality is unique to each person. And uh, we do know that doctors are notoriously bad at determining the cause of a patient's suffering. Uh, I remember a patient um, I was asked to see as a junior doctor, and he, he had lung cancer. And as I stood at the bottom of his bed, as I was about to, to go up and introduce myself, I could see that he was struggling to breathe and with, with every breath, he had a catch of pain. So when I was going to go up and speak to him, I, I was quite confident that 
when I asked him what was the cause of his suffering, he would tell me the pain, you know, the symptoms he was e experiencing. But in fact, when I started speaking to him, I discovered that he um, had been the patriarch of a large Lebanese family. And after he got sick and had to go to the hospital repeatedly, his family were not taking much notice of him. And he'd lost his position of authority within the family. And that loss of role within the family was causing much more suffering in his, ex in his life than any of the physical symptoms that he had experienced. And you, you can understand why doctors so often misunderstand what's very important for, for sick people when you compare what the patient is thinking about with what the doctor's thinking about. So we encourage our students uh, to actually speak to the patient and ask them about uh, the sources of their suffering rather than to make assumptions. This is a study done in Australia five years ago that showed that the majority of Australians think about spirituality and religion regularly. Uh, so this was done, done by Mark McCrindle's group. 68% uh, of Australians follow a religion or have specific spiritual beliefs. The, the beliefs uh, can be quite eclectic. Uh, nearly half of households upbringing, uh, nearly half of people say that the the religion of their um, their home during their upbringing influences their religious identity, and over half discuss spirituality or religion often or, uh, often or occasionally. Um, and it's uh, that's I uh, just remember that that the um, the religion of your upbringing um, has been shown to be quite significant for many people. The 2021 census showed that the majority of Australians still acknowledge religious affiliation, with Christianity as the most common religion and Islam and Hinduism as the fastest growing religions. And you can see the results there over the last three um, census um, data sets. And uh, this shows what it was very well publicised at the time of our last census that there has been a decline in Christian affiliation over time and a rise of the no religion category over time. However, this no religion category is quite interesting. Uh, according to the Australian census data, it refers to the broad group um, secular beliefs and other spiritual beliefs as well as no religious affiliation. That is, it consists of people who do not identify with a religion and those with non-religious beliefs, including agnosticism, atheism, and humanism. But it doesn't mean that they're not spiritual. We also see people in this group are uh, moving towards and away religion over their lifetime. There's some, um, and as I said from that previous study, people say they are influenced by the religion of their upbringing. So even if an adult identifies as non-religious on the census, we find that at different periods of their lives, they'll move towards and away from religion. And, and some evidence is, is demonstrating that uh, as people approach death, they may well call on religious constructs even if they've moved away from religi um, religiosity in their lives uh, for lack of any other um, conceptualization of death that helps them to cope uh, with their situation. An international study of people who are atheists, that is people who don't believe in God, and agnostic, that is people who don't know whether to believe there's a God or not, found that there's significant diversity in the group. Only about 2% um, identify as secular or humanist. Um, about 90% of the cohort fluctuate in a affiliation with religion over time. Um, so it's a cohort that's actually quite difficult uh, to uniformly categorise. And we're doing some analysis on definitions of spirituality in Australia at the moment. Um, the results, as I said, are quite eclectic and um, we should be publishing that paper next year. One of the main barriers to the introduction of spirituality into healthcare is a result of the confusion between spirituality and religion. 
When spirituality is understood as synonymous with religion, it's often rejected by both healthcare professionals and patients on grounds of a prior negative encounter with religion. However, within this model, religion is seen as a subset of spirituality, an organized form of belief, which is one way of expressing spirituality within universal human spirituality. Now, that doesn't mean religion is not important within healthcare. For some patients, it will be extremely important. And if you ignore it, you will be denying them one of the most important means of coping with illness that they have. And some needs of patients will be distinctly religious, such as the desire for ritual, and only specifically religious care will meet that need. However, if you limit spiritual care to religious patients, you'll disadvantage a lot of other patients um, who still have spiritual needs. So we, we need this broad definition of spirituality um, to be able to apply it within the healthcare um, context and to keep the door open for chaplains within healthcare. Now, spiritual well-being, the positive aspect of um, being spiritual, can be measured. This is my favourite uh, measure to use in research. It's called the FACET SP in its short name. And spiritual well-being with this model is measured as three factors, faith, peace, and meaning. Studies using the FACET have found that spiritual well-being is positively associated with quality of life in cancer patients, independent of other factors. So subjects with a high level of spiritual well-being will report high life enjoyment, even in the presence of a high level of symptoms. Spirituality was in fact found to be associated with quality of life to the same degree as physical well-being. This was the first validation um, of uh, this, this study, but it's been replicated many times, including in Australian patients uh, by Ian Olver, who's in Adelaide. Interest in spirituality in healthcare began when it was observed that people who regularly attended church in southern USA had some positive health benefits. And uh, you'll see uh, some of um, the, the ways in which uh, high spiritual well-being is linked um, to health benefits in this table. And uh, because this was first discovered in southern USA, where spirituality is pretty well synonymous with religion, a lot of the early literature in this field talks about religion and spirituality rather than just spirituality. But uh, over time, it was found that these benefits weren't limited to people who went to church, but that anyone with a high spiritual well-being uh, could share the benefits. And that's why spirituality is the term that's now used. We also need to be aware, though, that spirituality can have a negative impact. Uh, and you can see some of the, um, the examples there. And the classic case we discuss with medical students, of course, is that of the Jehovah's Witness who refused to receive blood products because of their spiritual religious beliefs. Uh, we had a very sad case in Sydney uh, a few years ago where a woman was diagnosed with leukemia where she was um, pregnant. Uh, 36 weeks pregnant and she couldn't receive treatment without giving birth and she couldn't give birth without receiving blood products because of the risk of bleeding and basically she continued to refuse the products and both she and her baby died which was just tragic and this can cause a lot of moral distress uh, for people working in healthcare where the beliefs of their patients differ from their own and their patients um, do not receive the treatment the doctor would like to offer uh, because of their spiritual beliefs. But it's um, a result of the elevation of patient autonomy is the highest ethical uh, factor that trumps all others uh, within uh, Australian healthcare ethics. But this is why we need to think about spiritual well-being uh, rather than just spirituality generally, um, because it can have both positive and negative effects. Just in passing, high spiritual well-being is also advantageous for those who work in healthcare. And several studies now have observed a connection between compassion fatigue and burnout. 
um, and that they're both reduced when levels of spiritual well-being are high. In fact, all of us uh, will do better in life if we ensure that our level of spiritual well-being is high, and we do this by making sure we um, have access to our sources of spiritual strength. Now, you might wonder how patients feel about the introduction of spirituality into healthcare. And this is a review I published a few years ago that showed that most patients think it is appropriate for doctors to inquire about, about spirituality, mainly on grounds that the doctors need to know their patients well in order to prescribe appropriate care and develop, um, it's, they also think it's needed to develop the level of trust needed for the relationship to work well. Uh, but you'll note that not all patients want to talk about spirituality, which we do need to keep in mind. Uh, this is a study we recently published um, from a study we did across six hospitals in Sydney. Uh, so we um, surveyed nearly a thousand patients across the six hospitals. And it also showed high patient acceptance for spiritual discussions in healthcare. Um, we um, we asked them whether this type of discussion would be acceptable and how they'd like it um, to be discussed, what vocabulary should be used. And um, you'll see that over 90% um, of patients thought uh, it was a, a relevant discussion point, uh, very high levels of acceptance. This is the second paper from this study, which uh, has just been accepted for publication. I found that the first preference for patients in terms of who they talk to is a chaplain. Um, and the second is the doctor, but there'll be more about that in a moment. Uh, this is a 2019 uh, study that was done in Melbourne uh, with uh, Clara Callahan and her team. Uh, it involved 40 patients and carers in a palliative care unit. And they found that while patients and caregivers can have divergent views about the scope of spirituality, all participants identified aspects of spiritual care that optimized their holistic well-being. The interactions reinforced the dignity of each person and was identified as an important part of the patient experience. Such care encompassed staff affirming each individual's worth and uh, recognizing that healthcare is a values-based experience. This is a survey done by the Spiritual Health Association in Australia. Um, it was um, uh, it was done by Mark McCrindle's group. Um, spiritual Health Association works to promote uh, spiritual care in Australian healthcare. So it's working with uh, institutions to try to ensure that spiritual care is available to all patients across the country. So this um, study sampled patients who'd previously been hospitalized for at least a week and asked them about their encounters with chaplains. And they found that the majority of respondents supported spiritual care in hospital and had had a positive experience and wanted it to be available in the future. But while spirituality is traditionally the domain of chaplains, Research has shown there are benefits to the patient-doctor relationship when the doctor asks about spirituality, independent of whether a chaplain's involved. And you'll see some of the benefits here, including improved doctor-patient communication, improved patient coping, and less ag aggressive treatment at the end of life, um, which saves money, which everyone in healthcare likes. This is a study by Karen Steinhauser in the United States. Uh, she's done a lot of work to see what influences quality of life for people at the end of life. This is an old study of hers from 2000 um, with nearly 2000 seriously ill patients. Uh, but she showed that um, freedom from pain was, as in, um, was equally first with being at peace with God as the first priority of patients at the end of life. And it, you'll just note that that wasn't quite picked up by the doctors in the same study. Uh, this is another American study by Tracy Balboni in Boston. 
um, she shows that when doctors ask about spirituality at the end of life, that less people would die in ICU. Now, it's not good to die in ICU. If you're terminally ill, you're much better off dying uh, with your loved ones around the bed and uh, in a less uh, intense atmosphere. So finding that less people died in ICU is actually a good finding uh, in uh, the palliative care world. I've also demonstrated this in terminally ill Australian patients in a study I did across three palliative care units in Sydney. And an interesting finding that might give chaplains uh, a bit of solace is to know that patients didn't expect their doctors to be spiritual counsellors. That's not why they wanted to be asked about spirituality. It was really the focus on holistic care that was enabled when uh, doctors talked about what was important uh, for the patients. And this is another study from the same, um, another paper from the same study, um, that one of the reasons um, it was helpful for a doctor to know the spiritual strength of the patient was that doctors have a lot of power in um, the healthcare setting. And for example, if the spiritual strength of the patient was their family and they needed their family with them at difficult times, the doctor was the one who could overrule visiting hours, for example, and allow the patients to stay overnight, for example, or to be there when bad news was being imparted. If someone um, is religious and wants access to their um, community uh, spiritual counsellor while they're in the hospital, the doctor can arrange for that as well. And I can remember a troop of about 12 Buddhist monks uh, walking through our palliative care ward once. Um, and the, the wonderful music that they played. And uh, doctors can make this happen. So, uh, do, and patients are very keen for the uh, doctor to be able to know what it is that helps them when times are really tough. But the practice of medicine is a moral enterprise. And it's important that we can, doctors consider the ethics. Um, and from an ethic pers ethical perspective, there's an imbalance in the doctor patient relationship that needs to be kept in mind uh, when doctors do talk about uh, these types of issues. And healthcare practice in Australia is overseen by the Australian Health Practitioner Regulation Agency, or APRA, and they establish the codes of conduct for healthcare workers in Australia. And this is the latest update of their document called Good Medical Practice, which is the expected ethical behaviour for doctors uh, in Australia. And uh, according to this document, doctors need to understand their own values and refrain from allowing them to cause distress in patients. And this is really uh, what limits the ability of doctors to evangelize or proselytize uh, because of the distress it can cause patients if it undermines their own belief system at a time when they're quite vulnerable. But on the other side, uh, Good medical practice requires doctors to respect the diversity of their patients and their colleagues, even when they don't agree with their values. So it's okay to discuss religious things so long as um, the patient's beliefs are respected. Uh, I, I remember uh, working uh, in one hospital where we had a lot of Muslim patients and during Ramadan, the diabetics used to come in having collapsed after fasting all day and still taking their medication. And um, basically they said, look, we don't want you to tell us not to, not to observe Ramadan. Um, they wanted us to say, this is what you need to do during Ramadan while you're fasting to manage your diabetes. So they said, we want you to respect our beliefs, just help us to work with them. Uh, so uh, respect for individual beliefs is uh, maintained. Um, so we, we encourage, uh, if, if you are someone in healthcare, we respect, uh, we ask pe people to have open and respectful communication on these topics. And we encourage our uh, healthcare workers, uh, not to shut down communication about these issues, but at the same time, not to prescribe your own views. It was interesting in a study I did with doctors that, the doctors least likely to talk about spirituality were either those who 
had no beliefs of their own and they didn't talk about spirituality because they just didn't think it was important. But the other group that were very reluctant to talk about spirituality were the Christian doctors. And the reason they didn't, uh, that, that they were hesitant is because they worried that they might uh, accidentally evangelize or be perceived as evangelizing the patient um, and get into trouble for that. So I think it's important that we learn um, for those in healthcare to have just open uh, discussions where uh, everyone's opinion is respected. This is a study where we analysed 174 patient physician outpatient palliative care consultations. Um, and we, we found that about half of the consultations involved mention of spirituality, and they were significantly more likely to occur if the doctor actually raised the topic. Spiritual care in healthcare then generally refers to recognising and supporting patients' spiritual well-being in some way. Um, so there are these concepts of spiritual history, spiritual screening, chaplaincy referral, which are often conflated in the literature. And, and this might be partly because just talking to a patient about spirituality um, is, um, can itself uh, represent a therapeutic intervention. Um, and that's explicitly acknowledged in some um, measures of um, spiritual discussion. Uh, so it's difficult to know where the line between talking about spirituality and actually uh, um, administering some sort of intervention uh, lies. But um, anyway, this is what the this these are the steps that are generally um, addressed uh, in this area. Um, and this is the current model of spiritual care, which is encouraged within healthcare, uh, where you have generalist, spe special, uh, generalist spiritual carers, which are the general hospital staff. Um, and the chaplain is the expert. And the idea is that the generalists will screen patients and, and, and just talk to them and, and see how things are going. And if they identify a spiritual problem, then they uh, refer the patient to the chaplain. Uh, chaplains are also known as spiritual carers or pastoral care providers in the healthcare space. Um, this is, um, I, I think this has been a very positive move because increasingly in Australia, chaplains are being moved out of healthcare. And as we train the generalists to have some idea of spiritual care, it means that patients still have someone supporting them, even if the chaplain isn't available. So it works well to, to see spiritual care as a responsibility of all staff members. Um, also, one person is, there's no one person who's always the best person to provide spiritual care. I, I can think of a, a young woman who came into our unit who'd been sexually abused by her father. And uh, she, she was in her early 20s. She was dying from cancer. And uh, she had a lot of spiritual problems. The middle-aged man, the physician, um, who was on admissions that day, wasn't the best person to talk to her. The chaplain was also a middle-aged male. So in the end, it was the female social worker who was able to gauge engage with her about spiritual problems uh, but and uh, but even if people don't feel they're the right ones just it's important that someone screens a patient for spiritual needs um, particularly at the end of life we'll look at this at a moment this is a study I did with palliative care specialists in Australia and New Zealand and you can it's pretty small text but basically it showed um, that those physicians who considered themselves spiritual were more likely to have had training in spiritual care, to feel confident in providing spiritual care, and more likely to refer to chaplains if they couldn't give spiritual care themselves. En engaging in spiritual care discussions actually does involve uh, advanced communication skills and spiritual awareness in the clinician. And uh, in fact, uh, attention to the clinician's own spirituality is often identified as the first step in spiritual care training. 
skills in this area are uh, developed with experience. Um, with uh, junior doctors, uh, we often recommend they just start with one of these tools with a mnemonic to help them remember what to ask about. This is one example called the HOPE questionnaire. It's been suggested though that a prescribed list of questions can prevent clinicians from giving their full attention to the patient. Um, I'm not sure about that, but I think beginners need something to start with. I found in my own research that experienced clinicians generally uh, prefer their own form of inquiry, which is generally a question such as what's important to you at, at this time. Personally, when I would see a new patient in palliative care, I, you know, after hearing their story, I would just say, you've had a really tough time. What is it that helps you get through these really tough times? And that would get me into the space of talking about spirituality. Some patients don't want to discuss spirituality until a bond has developed with a clinician. And that's okay too. If you raise it, you say, look, I'm, I'm someone who's happy to talk to, about these things and they can come back to you um, uh, when they're ready. This was the study with a paper from the study with the uh, Australian New Zealand palliative care physicians, and and I found that um, the participants described a delicate, skilled process to create a safe space where where patients felt they could discuss intimate topics and ask difficult questions, such as how long do I have to live. It's also uh, found that. Patients' spiritual needs fluctuate over time. Uh, we, we don't know a lot about the trajectory of spiritual suffering. We, we know there's a bit of an ebb and flow, but we, we don't really understand fully um, the precipitants. Um, so it's important that people check in over time. And for those of you who aren't healthcare workers, um, some of these uh, prompts um, can help, you know, in just your discussions when you want to check in with how they're going. Uh, are you at peace is a question um, that, that is good to ask someone you know is terminally ill. Um, how are you going spiritually is, is basically what you're asking them. Uh, but in my uh, own discussions with Australians, uh, healthcare professionals, I, I find that if, if you have a relationship with someone generally, uh, you can ch check in with how they're doing without any formal type of questionnaire. As we've said, um, when people do have uh, spiritual needs in healthcare, they expect to be referred to a chaplain. A chaplaincy is a service that helps patients, carers and staff make sense of the events that are happening to them and find meaning or a way through their current circumstances. And basically they provi provide a scaffold um, to support the patient while they're finding spiritual healing. Um, during uh, a difficult time in their healthcare journey. This is an African proverb uh, that I love. Uh, when the journey is too fast, sometimes the body has to sit down and wait for the soul to catch up. So in terms of uh, being someone who is a spiritual carer, I find it's just really to, to encourage our patients that the existential questions are important and um, they they do need to take the time to work through these questions uh, during their illness and, and that it is a legitimate use of their time. Architecture is very important to support spiritual care and, and many palliative care units and hospitals provide quiet places uh, for patients and their families to sit or lie down uh, and wait for their body to catch up. I'm just touching on a lot of areas in today's talk. Uh, at the moment, we do have some interventions to help people when they do have spiritual distress and are unable to find the resources within themselves uh, to overcome that distress and answer those existential questions. There are an increasing number of randomised controlled trials that are being conducted to investigate the effects of religious or spiritual interventions on the well-being of people um, in my area of palliative care is, are those with which I'm most familiar. But one of the most basic problems in this area is a lack of clarity regarding how the health impact of spirituality is mediated. In a recent randomised controlled uh, trial review of interventions um, through spiritual care, uh, those most frequently 
used were life review. That is where someone's encouraged to think about um, their life in retrospect and the important aspects of their lives and uh, the things they're most proud of, the messages they want to pass on to others. And this is compiled into a document and given to the patient, which they can share with their friends and relatives. And the other one is a form of psychotherapy, which is called meaning-based psychotherapy, where we help uh, people transfer um, the con. Often people find meaning in an aspect of their lives which becomes uh, unavailable to them as they deteriorate physically. And so it's a form of psychotherapy which helps them transfer um, their dependence onto something which is less transitory, something which is not dependent on their physical strength so that they can maintain or refine meaning within um, their existence as someone who is uh, physically debilitated. We'll need to watch this space. Um, but anyway, this is a big area that I'm, I'm just bringing to your attention. But in conclusion, research to date has shown that addressing the spiritual needs of patients in healthcare is associated with many positive outcomes for patients and their relatives. More work needs to be done to identify ways in which spiritual distress can be addressed. Um, and if anyone's interested in any of the papers that I've mentioned today, I'm very happy uh, to share them. But thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Bergen. Uh, so enriching. Uh, first of all, for mind and, and, and heart indeed. And I, I'm certain that uh, uh, your uh, presentation and uh, the information you, has, uh, you have provided uh, resonates with uh, many of us uh, directly or indirectly in that relational space where we are actually. I particularly enjoyed uh, that distinction at some point between pain and suffering. Uh, I think it's uh, such a, a tremendous niche to, to explore, you know, with the latter, the suffering having uh, much broader implications of a relational, social, cultural nature. Yeah. Uh, and uh, uh, the solution you, you you offer, this holistic, what do you call it, bio, psychosocial, spiritual approach uh, yeah. for both uh, to both the sickness and healing. This, this is uh, uh, a tremendous uh, uh, tool, uh, a lens uh, through which to consider uh, our human frail reality. Um, and uh, on this note, I uh, 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 give the floor to uh, April, who has uh, roughly 10 minutes uh, uh, to respond. Uh, thank you, Doro. And before I begin, I just wish to thank Chris, Neil, Doro and the ISCAST team for the invitation to join with you all today. I'm particularly grateful um, to Associate Professor Megan Best for sharing her work with me in preparation for today's seminar. And so in response, I can't help but consider John Swinton, a Scottish theologian's words, that we all see theology through our own lens. And it is a lens which will influence what we are seeking from today's discussion. Like Megan, I too come from a health background and I'm mindful that it's my experiences as a critical care nurse, then my roles of pastoral practitioner, department manager and CPE educator, that significantly shape my theology, my understanding of spiritual care, and hence my response to the paper. I wish to thank Megan in her presentation for her highlighting to us the relationship between spirituality and health and how our understandings of who and what matters in our world can be impacted by a potentially life-limiting illness. The spiritual needs of another can be heard in the questions emerging at the critical junctures in an illness trajectory. Perhaps it's at the time of diagnosis when the results of an early morning blood test has you sitting before a haematologist by mid-afternoon. They may be heard in the day treatment ward awaiting chemotherapy to commence. 
or in those transitional moments when decisions are to be made about what's working, what's not, and where do we go to from here? When goals of care shift from acute to supportive to a palliative focus. It is that biopsychosocial spiritual model of care that can restore a sense of healing. For spirituality is infused through all our discussions regarding quality of life needs. And the use of spiritual care assessment tools such as the Fitchett or the HOPE model clearly help us ascertain these needs. Through the offering of research, Megan has helped us consider the opportunities and challenges that doctors may face when exploring spirituality with their patients and the communication skills required to provide a safe space for these discussions. In his text, Stories We've Heard, Stories We've Told, Jeffrey Cutler highlights that those who share their story are fully aware of when the listeners were bored, disengaged, awestruck, or shutting down. And they continually made decisions about what was safe and appropriate to share and what crossed a line. For the key feature underlining all spiritual care is the trusting relationship with the other. We are also reminded that spiritual care happens in unexpected moments and another spiritual needs most often come in stories shared. For it's our patients and their families who decide what they talk about, who to and when, highlighting the importance for all healthcare disciplines to be trained in spiritual care. For good spiritual care, is about accompanying another through periods of uncertainty, endurance, suffering, and hope. Megan has also drawn our attention to the importance of spiritual care for staff and to consider how do we look after our most valuable resource, which is each other. For as we ascertain another's beliefs, values, and sense of meaning, do we dare to consider the impact of our own social, cultural, personal, and religious values on the encounter? Paraphrasing Parker Palmer on vocation, we are reminded about the importance of listening to our own story and letting our life tell us the truths that we embody and the values we represent. For in this light, we must also consider what are the personal attributes required to provide spiritual care in the healthcare context? And what is the role of professional supervision to support those working in the front line in healthcare? I too loved the African proverb, when the journey is too fast, sometimes the body has to sit down and wait for the soul to catch up. But I'm inviting us to expand this further and to ponder who does the waiting with the soul in healthcare? This allows us to bring our focus to gain a clearer picture on the role of spiritual care practitioners in spiritual care. Theologian Ewan Kelly comments that spiritual care is not just an act of listening and waiting with others. It's how we do it that's most significant. It's seeking to discern the right moment to interject or act, and whose need is being met by doing so. But it's actually an art and requires hard work and reflexivity and a commitment to reflect on our practice. As mentioned by Megan, Spiritual Health Association describes the provision of spiritual care as attentive and reflective listening, seeking to identify the person's spiritual resources, hopes and needs. It is provided from a multi-faith and spiritual perspective, offering support, comfort, spiritual counselling, 
faith-based care and religious services to people and families. In his 2021 research on lifting the leading chap on chaplaincy, Steve Nolan comments that chaplaincy care can be grouped into several categories as affirming the divine or supporting transcendence, working with belief and life philosophy, the use of ritual and being with, present to the other and supporting the institution. In 2017, Jane Jewell and George Fitchett et al. also identified in studies that over half the chaplains working in palliative care are frequently involved in addressing goals of care with people and their families, that they play an important role in helping people and their loved ones make significant decisions about end of life treatment and facilitate communication between patients, families, and the healthcare team. So the question to be asked is our spiritual care practitioners and chaplains the most underused resource in healthcare today? However, lessons from the pandemic uncovered an unspoken reality in spiritual care. In research undertaken by Megan and her colleagues in understanding the role of chaplaincy during COVID, it was found that chaplains have a difficulty actually articulating their role. There was widespread misconception about what we provide. And in many cases, we were either redundant or to the rescue, depending on the needs of the healthcare facility. In examining our Australian context, Megan's research has indicated that patients support the, the introduction of spirituality into healthcare, despite the changing demographic of a religious affiliation in Australia. Again, research reinforced by the McCrindle studies. However, at a health leaders forum hosted by a spiritual health association in 2022, it's acknowledged that spiritual care in healthcare within Australia has no consistent model integrated into health services. The reality is that where you live, even which hospital the ambulance takes you to, can have a major impact on your access to specialist spiritual care. You may be met by a practitioner employed by the hospital, a chaplain employed by a faith community, but working as part of the hospital team, a local faith representative, or by a volunteer. The forum noting that spiritual care is not accepted as an integral part of whole person care by all health providers, that funding models for spiritual care and a lack of clarity about the role and credentialing all contribute to the challenges in the delivery of spiritual care in healthcare context. And as educators, faith leaders, theologians and healthcare teams here today, I invite you to consider what role can you contribute in expanding and exploring spirituality in healthcare? For what we know is that emergency departments, intensive care units, and the corridors of busy hospitals are no place for the faint-hearted when patient needs and treatment plans are discussed. That responding to another during a time of trauma, caring for people and families through their illness, and working with healthcare staff require spiritual care practitioners to have a clear sense of their own identity and pastoral abilities with the capacity to work with interdisciplinary teams and with hospital leadership. When this is done well, these practitioners have a wealth of knowledge to contribute to patient care, to healthcare communities, and to the role of spiritual care in healthcare. As practical theologians, they also have much to offer the discipline of theology, bridging the gap between theology and medicine, as we all seek to contribute to our world. Thank you.
Thank you very much, April. Uh, what a beautiful convergence between the two of you. You both have uh, such a rich experience, uh, practical experience in uh, clinical settings, if that's uh, the terminology. Uh, apologies for my uh, lack of experience in this field, but also uh, as uh, researchers and uh, and educators, because on the one hand, we have uh, Megan with uh, uh, her uh, uh, very rich experience and uh, more recently at Notre Dame uh, and with uh, April uh, on the one hand doing research at uh, ACU on the other hand uh, uh, being a teacher uh, within um, uh, the Sydney College of Divinities uh, uh, CCPE. Uh, now I, I really loved uh, this uh, this idea of trust in relation, developing a trust in relation uh, with the other, you know, as part and parcel of uh, 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 the healthcare process, uh, and also the matter of how we do it. Uh, is it in a well? Let's call it because we are Christians here. Uh, we do it in a Christ-like manner uh, or otherwise, and I believe this is uh, a. Uh, good point, uh, uh, an opportunity for us to uh, remember uh, the fact that uh, in the early uh, Christian centuries, uh, Jesus was represented as a healer of souls and bodies. Now, on this note, uh, let's take a, a break of uh, 10 minutes or so, after which uh, uh, Chris will uh, take over with the Q&A. Thank you once again to both of you. Thank you. And uh, thank you to both our speakers today. That um, really is stimulating. And uh, uh, I guess we've all got our own experiences of um, healthcare. I have an experience myself, which some of you know about, of um, a son dying in ICU and thinking about spiritual care and um, the best way to care for people. And we're also going through a situation with um, one of our parents who's um, in, a, in a situation of us trying to work out how, how do we care best uh, for these people. So, um, Megan and uh, April, do you have anything you'd like to uh, respond to each other about before we open the, open the conversation to uh, everybody else? Um, thank you very much. I I'm very sorry to hear about your son, Chris. I didn't realise that. Um, yeah, look, I'm, I'm sorry for dropping that on you. It, it's just, you know, yeah. it, it I, I sometimes think it really, um, sometimes we we, um, we need to, we ground these things in the realities of every day. You know, this is happening to people all over the place, isn't it? And, and that's why these conversations are so important. Well, one of the reasons I thought this might be an interesting topic is that uh, we all have yeah. uh, interactions with the healthcare system. And one of one of the motivating factors for me to actually do my PhD in spiritual care was when a local hospital said they're going to shut down the chapel and mm. remove chaplains from the hospital. And I thought people need a chaplain uh, at times of healthcare crises. And I wanted to find some empirical data to show that there was an important role for spiritual care in the healthcare context. As with that Tracy Balboni study, we also showed that we could save some money with spiritual care, and which doesn't help at all. Well, it doesn't yeah. hurt at all to show that kind of thing. But yeah. I, I felt that it, it uh, with our current um, paradigm of evidence-based healthcare, it was really being um, overlooked as an important component of healthcare. Something that April that you touched on that I thought was very important is um, the need for uh, the carers to receive adequate um, support to have healthy spiritual well-being. And one of the things that became obvious uh, when I was working, sort of doing research with doctors was, it, was that if the carer hasn't faced their own existential fears and done the work in um, uh, understanding their own, the meaning of their own life, it's very difficult for them to support a patient because when the patient raises the existential questions, they become distracted by their own fears. And I'm particularly interested in the experience of suffering. And one thing that became quite obvious is that some healthcare workers know that a patient is suffering but avoid them because of their own death anxiety. So I think that whether we work in healthcare or not, if we want to support those important to us in a pastoral role, 
um, we do need to address our own existential fears. Mm. And I think yeah. as Christians, we have the resources. We need to do that. Mm. Mm. Absolutely. Um, I think we forget that we take who we are into the bedside. Uh, just as the person we're meeting and caring for brings their whole life story into the bed too. Mm. And hence, you know, I suppose my passion around really good supervision um, for all disciplines in this space to help them flourish just as we try to help those in our care be the best they can be. Thank you, Robert. Oh, thanks very much, Chris. And uh, thank you in particular, um, Megan and April. I, I found both of your presentations very interesting. And if I may highlight just two points of many, the the HOPE tool, if I may call it that, the H-O-P-E and the Life Review, which um, I would think gives people um, a great opportunity for peace and consolation in terms of a meditation on their own life. And um, I mean, just to refer to one form of spirituality, I have some familiarity with Ignatian spirituality, I think would relate to, very well to that. But my question was, specifically in terms of, of hope, um, in your experiences, at both um, Megan and April, um, how much is the specific question of, of hope um, crucial in uh, spirituality and, and healthcare, both in terms of hope in some sense of an afterlife and also hope um, by a dying person for the future of their loved ones? Thank you. Thank you for your question, Robert. Um, considering the just the enormity of of hope for different people, I think our starting point in spiritual care is understanding what does that mean for them. What does hope mean for the person? Um, is it the hope to gain a full recovery? Is it hope to go home and sit on the veranda one more time? And how, I suppose, the um, the substance of hope, for lack of a better word, what that looks like, um, shifts and changes as the person's understanding of their illness, their disease, uh, their dying processes shift and change. It oscillates, um, coming back to that concept that we're not always just working in a hopeful space with people, but in the course of a visit, you can be working in a space between uncertainty, suffering, endurance and hope all in one conversation as the story unfolds and the person's needs um, emerge. Thank you. I, I think the concept of, of what you say about hope for an afterlife uh, having an impact on how people face end of life is very interesting. I'm, I'm currently trying to get some research funds to look at whether those who do believe in an afterlife, such as Christians and those who don't, have a different approach to end of life. I'm sure all the researchers on this call will understand the challenges of getting research funds for a topic like spirituality and healthcare. But that is, there is, as I said in the talk, there is some evidence that, um, that even non-religious people will call on religious constructs at the end of life to make sense of where they're going. And uh, my own empirical research in this space has made me think a lot of people, when it comes to the crunch, aren't really sure uh, what happens after you die. And even even Christians. Uh, and Christians who you expect would have most hope uh, can be some of the most desperate um, to prolong life um, and avoid death. So I, 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 there hasn't been a lot of work done on this, and I'm very interested in this space. And hopefully I'll be able to report back on it in about a year's time if my grant comes through. Uh, I think what April said is, is um, very true. We, uh, we see a great um, utility in hope uh, in this space and we encourage our patients to hope in something reliable rather than um, place their hope in things that, that are going to let them down. So we try to avoid false hope. And and as a clinician, I would try to 
shift the focus of hope rather than even if, if a patient has their hope in something that isn't uh, going to um, eventuate, such as cure, we just try and shift the focus of hope to something um, that is is something uh, realistic, such as a good death. Thanks very much, and uh, all the best for the uh, grant application. <laughs> Thank you. Be wonderful. Thanks to you both. Thank you, Robert. Thank you. Uh, Neil, go ahead. Thank you both, uh, Megan and April. Um, look, uh, I remember oh, a, decade, a couple of decades ago when the ABC used to have decent religion programs on its radio. It doesn't anymore. But uh, they, uh, they had the story of a, a guy, a Baptist minister who'd been in missionary work and uh, after years and years of missionary work, he came back to Australia almost straight away he was diagnosed with MS. Uh, and his very first question was, why me? Uh, and then he paused for a while and then he thought, well, why not me? Uh, and it just seemed to me that that sort of reframing of the human condition uh, in terms of a certain inevitability of suffering but also when we ask the question, why not me, it becomes one of, for me anyway, what meaning can I make of this experience? Uh, and when we talk about the importance of meaning, it's not just something we discover, but it's something we decide to create in that situation. That we, you know, how do I make this a good suffering, a good death for others and for myself? I think that sort of reframing of the, the experience uh, is, yeah, it's not as if there's a meaning there that we find, but it's a meaning that we create uh, that I think, and that's what I think Victor, Victor Frankl was about. How do we Absolutely. make meaning in this situation? Anyway, they're, they're my comments. Thanks. I, I agree um, with what you say about Viktor Frankl. I think uh, he saw suffering as an inevitable part of the human experience, but that we all have the choice of how we respond to suffering when it occurs, and we can um, seek to find meaning or we can um, uh, be, become overwhelmed by the experience and it's interesting when I, I really think that uh, our society is moving away from an understanding that suffering is inevitable and I think we're seeing that in the legalization of assisted dying um, that there's uh, that as uh, people uh, lose sight of the meaning of suffering, they lose the willingness to tolerate it. And um, I think what we're seeing in the legalization of euthanasia and, and physician assisted suicide is people who, regardless of how they feel about death, they don't want to go through the dying process. And they just don't accept that suffering is something that they should put up with and, uh, and, and hence um, the, uh, with, with the, uh, with the elevation of the notion of autonomy, um, people have been given that opportunity to avoid any anticipated suffering. Yeah, I think we, we live in a society where suffering is considered the greatest evil. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and uh, we lose sight of the fact that losing ourselves, <laughs> uh, losing our soul is the greatest evil, really. Yeah. Um, and that uh, suffering may be about discovering that soul and 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 yeah, becoming reconciled to our situation. Anyway, yeah. Can I just say that um, I, there are some authors who would say that the final the final stage of human development can only happen um, when you realise that you're going to die and um, you are facing those existential questions that 
Uh, for example, Katie Erickson, who's a Scandinavian author, who's done a lot of work on the area of suffering from the perspective of nursing care, would say that you should pity people who never suffer uh, because they can't reach that stage of realisation of who they are as a person. Uh, but I think that as Christians, we, we need to be careful not to um, glamorise or, or overstate the benefits of suffering because suffering in itself is a terrible experience for many people. But it definitely has benefits. And is, I, I'm just wondering, as, as we're exploring meaning, is this where the space is for um, the provision of really good spiritual care? When we can sit in that space with another, hold that tension, listen to their experience, how people understand their experience, how their beliefs and values and judgments shape that understanding of their experience, and that how all of this combines and contributes to their decision making in their care. That that, you know, truly coming in and and listening to what does what does this look like for the other can enrich all concerned. Because most frequently in the story shared, people will begin with the story of when my dad died. And they have a benchmark or a ballpark of what suffering looks like for them. And so being able to hold that and to understand that and to work with that with an interdisciplinary team, I think can be a real um, asset that um, spiritual care practitioners, and forgive my bias for, you know, for flying the flag, but uh, can really uh, contribute into this space um, for people when we're looking at questions of meaning and suffering. So uh, as um, I guess we've hinted, but we haven't really stated, um, the professionalisation of uh, chaplains within Australia is something which uh, chaplaincy organisations are seeking to promote so that uh, chaplains are recognised as part of the allied health team within healthcare and included on the in the multidisciplinary discussions uh, around patient care. I was going to say, as we talked about, um, about suffering and Ericsson, of course, the diametrically opposed position is that of the techno-optimist transhumanists whose goal is to uh, ultimately extend human life forever and eliminate suffering totally. And I guess as reflecting on what April said about meaning, it seems that meaning for that sort of, those sort of people, meaning is simply about uh, promoting comfort and eliminating discomfort. Uh, and that's the that's the meaningful life, I guess. So I guess the question then here, let me ask a question because we don't want too many people making long comments. Um, <laughs> without without celebrating suffering, how can Christians help our society to recognize the possibilities, the positive possibilities of suffering suffering in terms of, um, what what Erickson was saying about uh, human development and um, maturity as a human being. Your turn, April. I think you. I, I think it's um you know just as you say that fundamentally what comes to mind is that whole role of accompanying another you know, the very heart of the Christian message, you know, to be with, to accompany, to discover, um, you know, to stay in that place of suffering and and not try to dive out of it because we're so uncomfortable too. Like, you know, it comes back to what we've already talked about, about knowing your own self well. And um, there's plenty of theologians that have written about that. And explored that, you know, it's it's not just what we do, but it's who we are in our personhood um, that I think we really bring when we're accompanying another in a place of extraordinary anguish and and suffering because 
you know, for any of us who have sat in that place, it goes to the core of your soul too. We are both transformed by witnessing those moments. Well, I think we have to remember that um, it's it's not wrong to, to want to avoid suffering. I mean, that's a, a good that we can recognise, that we all recognise as a, a universal good. I guess the difference between the transhumanists and us and Christians would be how you're um, hoping to achieve a world without suffering. And I must admit that Revelation 21 is my favourite chapter of the Bible and I turn to it regularly. Um, uh, but um, I, I agree with, with April. Uh, it's interesting that the etymology of the word suffering changed around the 1950s. The, the word suffering actually means to endure. And, and there was much more of a notion that uh, it was it was um, um, holding up under hardship um, was was what suffering was about, and that role of accompaniment uh, is certainly an important one. But but staying with suffering can be very difficult, and I certainly someone with extreme suffering. And I give a whole talk on suffering. It's a very complex topic. Um, but it it can be very difficult. And I know that when I've been with people with extreme existential distress, it makes me feel quite agitated myself to act, even be in the same room as them. But um, I think that as Christians, we need to articulate the stories of the benefits. It's We've heard all this, the stories about suffering um, I think a, a lot of what people are upset about is avoidable suffering. Uh, Florence Nightingale actually said that suffering is not a symptom of illness. Suffering is a symptom of inadequate care. And she was talking about all the things we could do in healthcare to actually reduce suffering. And, and she was talking about patients who just lay down and looked at the same part of the ceiling every day. And, and uh, I think there's a lot we could do within healthcare to uh, to uh, to uh, address the avoidable suffering but when it's unavoidable i think as christian uh, we need to be aware that human presence makes all the difference and i think our churches could do a lot uh, to accompany people who don't have loved ones who visit them in hospital who are left in nursing homes and have nobody caring what happens to them day to day so i think churches could do a lot to um, uh, transform the care of the dying in our society in that way and and um, that is really where the whole origins of the hospice movement came from was when the the monks opened up their their buildings to the wayfarers who were falling along the way and, and cared for them and, and were just humans so you don't have to be a healthcare worker to support someone who's suffering you need to be a human being and I think um, as Christians, uh, we, we would really uh, make a big difference if we took that role. Don Kappa. Thank you, Chris Mulheron. Thank you to you and Doru and to Iscast for promoting this event. Uh, I just I do want to say thank you to Megan and April too for the pointed to the quantitative as well as the qualitative research in this space. So I think often it, it's seen to be marginalised and, and merely speculative. So thank you for that. I've just finished teaching a unit on suffering and hope. So I should have shared a bit more marking with you if we'd had this a bit earlier. But uh, thank you very much. To a comment, if I may, I, I held back, Chris, I didn't want to be the third bloke in a row to make a long comment. So I'll make a brief one. But I'm sorry to be male. Um, boredom. It's That's unavoidable suffering, I think. I think it is unavoidable. So I'm not, I'm not prepared to do something about it, transhumanism or any other um, process notwithstanding. Um, I think Neil's right that there's a, an aversion to suffering, but I actually think one of the great um, moral sins of the 21st century is boredom. Uh, we're not able to tolerate boredom. And uh, marketing and our own dispositions fill that space with a lack of reflective practice and uh, purchase and always being on our phones and so on and so forth. And I think that th then the issue, I think, comes when we hit suffering, we don't have a mechanism to actually step back and we're totally absorbed by the worst of it. 
Uh, if I could ask you a question, it would be what empirical work could we do to further the conversation about the difference between healing and curing? Because it does seem to me that that tension is a big issue uh, for Christian prayer, uh, when people pray for a cure and, uh, in a sense, may actually miss out on some other kind of healing, uh, and perhaps even in the medical context where the focus is on uh, merely the, the somatic dimensions, as it were, the physical parts of what might actually be a, a more substantial process. So I hope that's a comment with a, a bit of a question in it. Thank you. Thanks, John. Do you want me to take that one? Yeah. Uh, I think the quantitative work, uh, a lot of it has been done, uh, showing that high spiritual well-being correlates mm. with high quality of life, regardless of the physical uh, state. In fact, spiritual well-being is as important as physical well-being when you ask cancer patients about quality of life. And that is how someone can be deteriorating physically as their cancer progresses, but growing in healing. And so in palliative care, we talk about people dying healed because they've reached that, they've done the work, they've reached that point of, of peace where they've answered the existential questions that were raised for them. And even though they are wasting away, they, um, they when you, you really uh, progress through this um, existential suffering and do all the work, you reach what we call transcendence. And, and uh, I don't know of any studies that have actually looked at quantitative measures, um, sort of variance in someone with transcendence because they're not all that common. But it would be interesting to do it because these people are so alive. They are the most alive people you have ever met. It's Someone said it's like they're flying, but they are so generous. And, and these are the people when you, um, um, these are the people that um, are just giving to everybody around them, even as they're lying in bed dying. But it, uh, one thing I would really like to do as a quantitative study is a longitudinal study looking at the, um, the trajectory of suffering and what factors um, influence the waxing and waning of suffering and, and just capturing the quantitative measures of, of emotional, psychological, spiritual well-being at different points of the trajectory. Mm -hmm. I've been trying to get money for that study for years. I suppose and to contribute um, to what Megan said, um, one of the areas of real interest for myself is uh, the role of healthcare teams, and this comes out of experiences in acute health in haematology units, where I have seen people and, and listened to their stories of who they thought they were and who they are being confronted to be is radically changed by their diagnosis and their illness trajectory. But the impact and when they are in a, a supportive environment of people being able to, and as one lady said to me once, and we were talking about her impending death. She said, it doesn't matter if I die now. She said, because I know who I am now and I have found my voice. And so I'm really fascinated about what happened in that unit that, uh, that created the community for this woman to rediscover herself. What did we do? Nobody else set out to do that. No one set out to do that. But what happened that brought that sense of healing to this lady, um, for her to, to be able to claim who she was, even in the face of her dying? I think that's a good point. Um, people do need to do the work themselves. You can't find someone's meaning for them. They need to find their own meaning. But you can definitely create the environment that allows that to happen, and I think personally, that acknowledging that this is something that is worth doing. I think that's the main role of the carer is, is to say these are important questions and you are right to address them and that they're important to address. Yeah, thank you both. How fascinating would it be to talk to the um, families and friends of those who sort of arrive at transcendence 
and see what that does. Uh, that would be an interesting longitudinal study. Oh, yeah. Well, it's, they, they have a huge impact. You don't forget mm. them once you commit them. Mm. Yeah. No, thank you very much. Thank you, John. Fascinating uh, conversation. Yeah, I, uh, I, I wonder... Uh, uh, to what extent uh, most health professionals uh, are open to uh, the possibility of uh, uh, a more complex way of healing uh, where, well, spiritual, uh, spirituality, uh, broadly put, uh, plays a role. Uh, I think this is a fertile field, but also a battleground because what we usually call faith and science seems to be at home uh, in that area. Uh, and I assume the convictions of, uh, of a health practitioners are very important from this viewpoint. What could determine someone to embrace, uh, let's say, this broader view uh, of uh, healthcare uh, when one's own, con uh, own convictions are, say, very positivistic and um, mechanistic about life? I would say compassionate witnessing. You know, in, in, in my experience, I'm sure, of any of the pastoral um, colleagues here today, it's when, you know, your, your physicians, your intensivists, your ED doctors actually get to witness you doing what you're doing, that they get to hear the patient's experience of spiritual care. They get to read it in the notes. Um, ideally, that we articulate what we do really well and succinctly, that there's that space for collaborative inquiry. And not only does it invite the space for um, consideration of the, the patient's needs, but dare I offer um, the consideration of their own spirituality and their needs. And it's um, it's a very rich area to, and a very, um, people can, you can find people can be profoundly generous when they realise that you're there for them too, just as much as you are for people and families. Mm. And as they explore their own meaning making, and I thought it was this, but now I'm not so sure. And what does this mean for me now? There's actually very high interest in spirituality and healthcare once healthcare workers realise what it is, as I was saying. And, but I do think the biggest barrier in Australia is that when you mention spirituality, most Australians think religion. And there's a lot of opposition to religion and healthcare. Uh, I once uh, spent time trying to understand is, is there a stigma against religion? And uh, it wasn't so much a stigma as people just thought it didn't belong there. And part of it was due to the historic origins. Um, but uh, once people understand uh, the role of spirituality in healthcare, there's um, a big demand for training to know how to address it. Um, there's, as a result, because of this barrier, in many countries, uh, there's a move to change the word spirituality. In, particularly in Europe, people are saying, why don't we talk about existential concerns rather than spiritual? Uh, and um, uh, just try and avoid this confusion so people don't miss out on spiritual care. Thank you. Okay. That's it. I'm going to say it's definitely a sense of accompanying and being with, staying with the patient and not jumping ahead of them, not presuming, but hearing well. And in the plethora of, of, of the discussion, picking the thread of the discussion that they offer that will take them to the place that they're really asking about. And um, there are so many threads that a patient will give from the fact that my dog's not being fed, which is important, and to questions like, what's it like to die? What happens when you die? So many questions. And in getting a sense of the one that they really want to know about and following through with that. And um, even I've been like in... In um, intensive care, was someone will say, can you read to me the Bible? And then what would you like me to read? What part? Um, and um, or the, someone will say, my neighbour's not coming to see me and I'm feeling deserted. And that really is a sense of loneliness as when, when you find and dig through that. I'm feeling abandoned. 
and finding what they really want to know and what they want to talk about. Um, yeah. Thanks, Jan. Thank you. Mm. Yeah, uh, th thank you very much uh, uh, to both uh, speakers and Chris and uh, all involved. Um, and uh, uh, now I'd uh, uh, like to invite uh, my ISCAS colleague, uh, Jackie Liu, to make some announcements before we uh, wrap up. Um, so if you enjoyed today's talk, I would really highly recommend that you come to um, the events that I will be telling you about Firstly, this is um, the next session in our seminar series. Um, we will be hearing from Lisa Sedaris on the 16th of October, which is another Monday from two to four. And we'll be discussing undying love, religious and ethical perspectives on pet cloning. Lisa is a professor of environmental studies at the University of California with affiliation in religious studies. And we'll also have a response from Margaret Somerville Professor of Bioethics at the University of Notre Dame, amongst many other titles that I unfortunately cannot fit into this short bio, but um, I can say that she has received eight honorary doctorates, so maybe that says something. Um, the next event that I'd love to invite you all to is Uncharted Waters, Christian Ethics in a Rapidly Changing World. This is our next conversation series with NZCIS. And over 10 weeks, we'll be hearing from 10 speakers on some really fascinating and uh, um, challenging ethical issues that are stemming from scientific and technological progress. Uh, Megan Bess is going to be featured on this as well. So um, we'll be talking about prenatal screening. We'll be talking about um, abortion, gender, all the spicy topics that you could think of. That's it from me. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, uh, Jackie. Um, well, uh, this is it. It has been uh, exciting. It has been moving. It has been very informative. Uh, I am personally grateful to uh, Megan and, uh, and April and uh, to all involved. And uh, it's good to walk together. Um, see you next time. And until then, Godspeed. <laughs>